there will be the possibility for whitelisting of cookies and uh, provide one or several providers in the browser settings. This is also something new to this draft now. This is a huge risk to the entire advertising industry in general. They can't really target anymore unless there's consent. And as you and I probably do ourselves, you just click no, right? Most people simply click no because they don't want to decide. For the time being, I see us being stuck in cookie banner hell. Hello, everyone. I am Sergio Maldonado, and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy, and technology with a clear goal in mind, which is redefining the relationship between people, brands, and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity, or if you will, human centricity. It may take us five years, ten years, or more, but we're patient. We're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Okay, we're back from a little Easter break. I hope you were missing this. We have Katharina Weimer and Kirsten Amon with us today, both of them coming from Phil Fisher, a well-known law firm. Katharina is a partner in the privacy team based out of Munich with more than 12 years of experience advising international clients in the data protection field. Kirsten works in Phil Fisher's IT and privacy team in Hamburg. She develops practical privacy solutions for her customers primarily based in Europe and the US. I've been looking forward to discussing the latest draft of the e-privacy regulation, and I need to explain what this means so it doesn't sound like uh, Chinese, for those that don't speak Chinese, <laughs> as, we, as we get started. The essence here is that in Europe, as many of you know, we've had this cookie law, which in the end is a framework, is a directive, as we call it, that means that every country has to implement that framework within their own national laws. So this means there's plenty of disparities and what is allowed in the UK may not be the same in France. In fact, it is not the same. So there's different guidelines and so on. Now, a regulation promises to harmonize this. We did this with the GDPR as a generic framework for privacy and we were hoping to do the same thing for e-privacy. So that means cookies, metadata, over-the-top services, and so on. But we couldn't do it. There was so much debate that in the end, even though we had a proposal on time back in 2017, uh, this thing didn't happen. Bottom line, we are here. 2021, we finally, finally have a draft the uh, the Council of the European Union published this draft on February 10th, and we're going to discuss this draft. This could be almost the final version. It has to be agreed with the other parties, but once we have it, then we may be able to apply the same uh, rules and practices across the European Union. I'd like to clarify that EDPB stands for European Data Protection Board, that's where the data protection agencies meet. So from different countries, we call them supervisory, supervisory authorities as well. They meet within the EDPB. Also, EDPS is different. That's the European Data Protection Supervisor. We'll mention it in passing. And it refers to an advisory body. It's pretty much an independent data protection authority. Something that you'll see we mention as well is some case law. There's one case uh, presented before the Court of Justice of the European Union called Planet 49, which in essence defined the relationship between or confirmed the relationship between the e-privacy framework and the GDPR. As you will see, consent is defined by the GDPR. So, for example, in Article 4.11, it is made very clear that consent has to be free or freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous. That means also very you know, granular and all the things that you've been 
uh, seen the past few months. So we want to discuss this from a legal perspective, hoping it will make sense for marketers as well and for others. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. Welcome, Kirsten and Katarina. Hello, Sergio. Jumping straight into this thing, um, I was so eager to cover e-privacy and to cover the, the latest draft. What's new in there? In my view, it, it makes sense to introduce um, a little bit of background at this point. Please do, yes. So that um, the e-privacy regulation already has a long history. And so, yes, the last draft prepared by the European Commission had been published even before the GDPR came into force. And now um, they were intended to come into effect at the same date. However, the negotiations um, regarding the e-privacy regulation have been tough ever since. And so at the moment, the key fields of the e-privacy regulation, the confidentiality of communication, privacy controls through electronic consent and browsers and cookies, mm, there's still the e-privacy directive of 2002 as amended of 2009 applies. And so in comparison to a regulation that would be directly applicable, EU directive must be first implemented to local law of the member states. And now the new draft has a very broad scope. In the IoT services field, um, the rules will also cover now machine-to-machine -machine data yeah. transmitted uh, by a public network. So for example, home assistant data, connected thermostats, connected medical devices, smart meters, or also automated and connected vehicles. So this is an interesting new part here. And yeah, for as a general rule, all data will be confidential under the draft. Any interference generally will be prohibited, except when explicitly permitted by the privacy regulation. The collection will only be allowed with the user's consent or for other specific transparent purposes. But here we do have a consent requirement in general, but there are also a lot of exemptions. And yeah. this is something that is also an interesting part at this point because these exemptions are considered quite broad. Is there anything that you believe is important to note about cookie consent in the latest draft? Yes. Um, well, generally for consent, there will also apply the requirements of Article 7 GDPR, mm, but still, um, yeah, really, maybe it's be easiest if I explain a little about the background of the cookies practices, yeah. um, because these practices have also been affected by a variety of court decisions at this point um, with respect to the e-privacy directive that is still effective at the moment. So in particular, Article 5.3 of the directive. And so most importantly here um, at this point is the decision of the um, CJEU um, of October 2019 and the sweepstake provider Planet 49 that determined the cookie consent practices. And the court also made clear at this, that consent was required for all not technically necessary cookies. And then in Germany in May um, last year, also a decision of the Federal High Court has fundamentally changed the previous practice. And now we also see an increasing enforcement regarding cookie consent practices here by the data protection authorities. So now under the draft, it is that the council has now emphasized in, in the press release that the, the end user should now have a genuine choice on whether to accept cookies or similar identifiers. However, making access to a website conditional uh, on whether to accept cookies for additional purpose as an alternative to a paywall, such as cookie wall, will be permitted if the user is able to choose between that offer and an equivalent offer. Yes. And so this is um, regulated in recital 20 AAA, and this is definitely something very new about this draft and yeah, what has been quite controversial before. We've had a lot of debate about this one, about cookie walls. Because in the first draft that we had from the commission, 
they were not allowed. And the background for that was something that within the, the EDPS at the time, uh, Butarelli, who was still there, had been advocating pretty strongly against the, uh, the notion of data as a commodity, or personal data as a commodity. And there was a perception that if you allowed people to either pay with money or consent to cookies, as it seems to be allowed now in the latest draft, then you are, in a way, letting people pay with their data. What do you think, or Katarina, what do you think, you two? Um, I, I, I'm finding that a very interesting uh, conversation in general, uh, because data already are a commodity, right? So we are all already using personal data to pay, even though we may not be fully aware of it. Just think about having an account at Facebook. Of course, you're paying with your data, right? Because Facebook is free and it always will be, as they keep saying. But of course, they collect all your personal data and, and be, don't, don't make a mistake about it. They're using it. So why not make this completely obvious by saying, hey, you can pay with your data. You can pay with your money. Um, either way, um, it is your choice. Um, I'm, I'm, and and by, by doing this, we also, to a certain extent, should be aware that we're giving um, the, the, we're giving control back to the user. They can actually choose how they want to use their data or not. So I'm not completely um, opposed to cookie walls and opposed to using data as a commodity because if it's my personal data and I can use it for payment, why shouldn't I have the possibility to choose accordingly? But on the other hand, what the new draft is saying also quite clearly is there has to be an equivalent offer by the same provider that does not involve consenting to cookies. So we have to have that um, equivalent offer, um, which I, you can then of course make against payment. So we'll see how that actually plays out in the future. We have to also consider companies that have to rely on advertising revenue, such as newspapers, magazines, and things like that, who will severely suffer from not being able to place cookies anymore. We'll come to back and we'll come back to that at yeah. a later stage in the discussion. But I think the notion of paying with your data is something that will be of increasing importance. And why not? Why not actually consider it as a commodity? It's there, it's being used, then at least let me control and let me yeah. let me benefit. You, thank you, Katarina. We've had a debate over and, and over. And so I don't want to get deeper into that one, but I will tell you that the the prevailing argument so far has been that if people were allowed to pay with their data, uh, that then data or privacy becomes luxury, right? And that what Buttarelli was saying at the time is, oh, then only only the rich will be private, will have privacy. And then maybe you open the door to people selling their organs you know, from an extreme point of view, right? Absolutely. So there was that, that moral uh, debate. And we've had that discussion with, with some people on the, on the Spanish um, feed for this podcast. But I didn't want to drag you into that one. Eh? <laughs> Thanks for that. We all do need to think more. And the ethical aspects that you just raised are extremely important. I mean, us in the in the western rich world for us it's easy to decide right um for others it may not be so yes that's something where also the advertising industry and the big players will have to come up with solutions for that good so let me move on unless kirsten you think there's anything else that we should uh point out about changes um well i think one interesting aspect is as well um that there will be the possibility for whitelisting of cookies and uh, provide one or several providers in the browser settings. This is also something new to this draft now. And so software providers will be encouraged to make it easy for users to set up and amend those whitelists on the browsers and withdraw consent at any moment. That one is key. So, and it connects with what Katharina was saying about advertisers. This is super important because right now, We've been trying to escape pop-ups, cookie banners. We're sick of them. In fact, at the very outset, when we had the when they started working on the on the e-privacy regulation, they did say that there was an objective behind this, which is let's try and get rid of this, this banner fatigue, as the, the Portuguese presidency was calling it recently. 
The problem is, yes, how do you get rid of it? Either you allow something like legitimate interest applied to some of these uses, as I know some people in ad tech have been advocating, or you impose on the browsers the requirement to gather consent, as it had been hinted as well. Within the latest draft, there's that encouragement to browser software providers to let us as, as users whitelist certain types of cookies, which would also make it easy for us to avoid having to consent to everything on every publisher, for example. The problem then is how would that consent be specific? So connecting this with the EDPB, because they've already looked at, at the drafts and they have their own ideas. Do they have any proposals? And even before zooming in into cookies again, uh, in general, does the EDPB have anything that you would like to comment on? Yes, indeed. Um, we, we have uh, looked into that. And so in particular, the relationship between the GDPR and um, other consistent European fra framework um, is one concern that the EDPB is raising at the moment. Um, and also they are saying that the data retention is now really an issue. Um, that's in Article 7.4 of the draft because only targeted retention for the purposes of law enforcement and safeguarding national security is allowed under um, European legislation. And this has also been clarified uh, lastly, so in October of last year. And this is now something that where they are raising concerns here. And yes. There was plenty of debate around metadata. And if, if telco, not just the, the OTT providers, but telco operators like, again, Deutsche Telekom and, and Telefonic and all, and all of these, they have been for a long time retaining data under the assumption that it was anonymous. I know we've had this, this discussion uh, about you know, that data. And we've known that for a long time, law enforcement has been imposing, there's been these changes in Brussels, different, you know, there's been a back and forth about whether you should keep this data because we need to police the network, etc. But something that I noticed, and as you just mentioned, is that retention periods have to be uh, controlled. In principle, up to this point, if I understood it properly, you could, if you're an operator or an ISP, you could keep that data because it wasn't personal data, it's anonymous. Therefore, it was out of scope. What's been happening after that is plenty of little scandals, at least in Spain, with data that's purchased from the operator in aggregate and then mixed up, correlated with other data sets and through correlation, deduplicated so that you can get to actual people. What now we say here is that, if I understand well, even anonymous data could be subject to retention periods. Um, yeah, it, the new draft is, is pretty clear. So retention is only possible and allowed for purposes of law enforcement and safeguarding national security. And this has um, also been clarified by the CJEU in, in the October 2020 decision. Um, and I know that maintaining data or preservation of such data has always been subject to major discussion in, in the member states of the EU. And as you're probably aware, Sergio, in Germany, we've had milestone judgments in the past on such data preservation. And all of them have basically um, have basically devalified these um, data preservation practices and laws by being non-constitutional. Um, and through the back door of the new e-privacy regulation of this draft, this preservation of data in case it might be useful for future law enforcement or safeguarding national security is reintroduced, which is also one of the major criticisms by the German um, regulators who are looking at this draft with major concern and especially in that area. And um, oh, yeah. in Germany, we will just 
have to sit tight until the constitutional court gets a hold of this and um, let's see how this is going to pan out. But I, I agree, this has been a major topic of discussion in many of the member states and because of our very special German history um, in Germany, we're very concerned about um, preservation of data, even if it's only metadata. Um, that it can be of such big value. And looking at your Spanish example, uh, it just goes to show yes. that even data that is now anonymous might not be anonymous anymore in the future just because you have such a big data lake. You can paint it, combine it with other data as you would, for instance, also with medical data. Um, there's always that risk, which is a lot more apparent. But from what you explained in the Spanish example, that seems to be a, an incredible risk to take. So anyway, let me just speed ahead, okay? Let me ask you this then. If we are forced to get in consent, right? Because there'll be uses that won't be covered by the new exceptions. For example, something that we haven't mentioned but has been there all along is that we finally have an exception for analytics. There is a an exception for audience measurement, which shall be limited to non-intrusive practices that are not likely to create a privacy risk. You can see that this is the, the, the audience measurement as such, which is meant to be permitted, already is, is really not much, right? It, it gives you some sort of audience measurement, right? But you can't track, you can't do cross device tracking with that exception. And it remains to be seen how this audience measurement will be approved in the end, because the, again, the objections here by the EDPB and by other authorities are huge. Uh, on that one, I've been pushing for this one for a long time. You know, from in the early days, the UK, the ICO had raised the concern that people needed to maintain their websites and they needed to see statistics in general to see how, you know, which content worked best without knowing who was looking at the content. But finally, it was the French in, in 2013, the CNIL, did publish these guidelines explain that if you used uh, analytical cookies, then you could look at a list of conditions. And if you met them, then you could do it. All of the things that we see people doing today in web analytics would not be allowed because you wouldn't be able to cross, as you said, a cookie from Google Analytics with a cookie from Google Ads to see the performance of an ad. What's your feeling about analytical cookies or audience measurement in Germany so far before the privacy regulation? Well, we still do have uh, some guidance from the um, DSK, it's called, it's an, a data protection association. And they were clearly advising that consent would be required in, I think, May of last year. And so the situation in Germany from, from the data protection authorities perspective is actually quite clear. But now after the decision of the federal high court, um, we've also seen this very increasing um, enforcement of, um, of the data protection authorities. They are also telling now that, um, well, maybe still number one is Schrems two, but then the cookie um, issue will be what what the data protection authorities will be after. And so, of course, as we um, do have this specific um, situation here that in Germany, that because of the federalism, that we have a lot of different data protection authorities, um, they sometimes are taking a slightly different view, um, but, well, they are quite clear about that Google Analytics will require consent in Germany. So now going into the rest, after the regulation, the way it looks now, the way it's looking now, we're going to need to gather consent for more for everything else. Katharina, what do you think? Will we be stuck in cookie banner hell forever? For the time being, I see us being stuck in cookie banner hell. Um, it's still best practice. Um, there are certain gold standard out there, which means you have to have this two layers. You have to have your cookie banner. You have to have three buttons on there um, and not just two. Um, it must not be clickable as in you can't click it away. You can't exit away. Um, 
And then in the first layer, you have to explain a few words as to we're using cookies and tracking technology. If you need more information, please go to so and so. And in the second layer, gold standard is you really have to elaborate on the cookies that you use, um, what which purposes you use them for, how you get the information, the duration of the cookies and of the information that is stored behind it. And I don't see any of that going away unless we move forward with the whitelisting. Um, the whitelisting could help us, but then the users have to sit down and whitelist, right? So you have, you do, as a user, you have to somehow concern yourself with all of that. Um, and and you, I, I always keep thinking it's your data. You're somehow responsible for it. And if you want, if you don't want others to use it, you can just click no. That's fine. Um, and that is one also one of the biggest business impacts of this entire cookie consent issue. But generally, you can always say yes. no, but you can also differentiate. Sometimes it's okay to let websites use cookies. Why not? Um, so we're not going to escape it in general, no. <laughs> would you say that's the one thing that will impact businesses the most or anything else you would add? This is a huge risk to the entire advertising industry in general. Um, and also to internet companies, internet services providers who rely on advertising revenue simply because they cannot provide the information anymore. They can't really target anymore unless there's consent and as you and I probably do ourselves, you just click no, right? Most people simply click no because they don't want to decide. They don't want to read. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you don't even have the choice. Sometimes it's just object or accept. Some, some companies still haven't gotten the memo. So um, there are still banners who are not compliant. But um, also things like cold calling for direct marketing purposes is not going to be allowed anymore. We've had that in Germany as a prohibition for a long time. Um, now it's, it's in general not possible anymore um, unless you call within an existing customer relationship, but then it's not cold calling, right? You also have a bigger administrative burden in many things. You have to remind your users that they've consented and you have to give them the option to withdraw their consent regularly. So all of that, I, I don't really see how this is making internet life easier. And at the same time, at least for Germany, but in general also, I don't really see a heightened protection. So I'm not quite sure where the benefit is. Kirsten, Katharina, vielen Dank noch einmal. Das war gut. Ebenfalls, vielen Dank. Okay, that's all for today. Please find episode notes and links to our social channels and other feeds on mastersofprivacy.com. Please do not give us five stars on your favorite podcasting channel unless you believe there is no more room for improvement. Your candid feedback is probably more useful to us. Thank you.